Welcome to the Food Safety and Sanitation Training Module presented by the Maine Department of Education Child Nutrition Programs. This presentation will cover food safety and sanitation and standard operating procedures within your child nutrition program. It is required that all schools must employ or engage a certified food protection manager. This must occur within 60 days of a new establishment opening or the current food protection manager leaving. Serve Safe certification meets the criteria and is valid for five years. So why is food safety important in schools? First off, there are four high risk populations. These consist of young children, pregnant women, older adults, or people with a weakened immune system. You have potentially serve all of these groups, especially young children, which you know you serve every day. The number one risk of not maintaining a high level of food safety is foodborne illness. The definition of a foodborne illness reads, a disease transmitted to people by food or water. Foodborne illness turns into an outbreak when two or more people experience the same symptoms after eating the same food. This is then confirmed in a laboratory. If you potentially have an outbreak, you need to contact us in the DOE Child Nutrition Office, contact your local health inspector, communicate with your school nurse, and have your ghost trays or samples ready. Some common practices related to foodborne illness include time and temperature abuse, poor cleaning and sanitizing, poor personal hygiene, cross-contamination. Other risk factors include purchasing from unsafe sources, improper storage, storing ready-to-eat foods below raw meat, and lack of training. So what are the different types of hazards? We have three different types of hazards that we're gonna talk about. There's biological, chemical, and physical. Biological hazards include sick employees working with food and putting others at risk. Chemical hazards include improper storage of cleaning supplies or using chemicals to clean while food is being prepared. And physical hazards would be band-aids that are not properly covered, fake nails falling into food, or even jewelry falling into food. Food safety is important in every step of the process. We are now going to break down the steps of the flow, and flow of food from beginning to end. The flow of food includes purchasing, receiving, storing, preparation, cooking, holding, cooling, reheating, and serving. The first step in the flow of food is purchasing. You want to make sure that you are using only reputable suppliers to order all of your food from. If Joe down the road is offering to give you the best deal on potatoes, it is your responsibility to make sure that his farming practices are safe, inspected, and approved. The next step would be receiving. It is your responsibility to make sure that your suppliers know you need to check the delivery before they leave. Check the temperatures of potentially hazardous foods. Do not be afraid to refuse to accept food that is not in good quality. You have a responsibility to your students to serve them safe food and to make sure that your suppliers know that you will not just accept what they give you. Make sure that you put deliveries away as soon as possible. We all know how busy it can get in the kitchen, but is it extremely important that food be put away in a timely fashion? Next is safe storage. When putting food away in your storage areas, there are many things to be mindful of. Always keep your chemicals 
separate from any edible food products and from your paper goods. Items must be stored away from the walls and at least six inches from the floor. Single use items should be stored in original packaging and covered. Always be mindful of FIFO. This stands for first in, first out. As a general rule of thumb, this applies, but always be sure to check the expiration date or use by dates of items and be sure to keep the items that are going to expire to the front of the shelf for first use. Make sure to discard any food that is past its expiration date. It is never a bad idea to date food when it is received. This way, you can ensure that your supplier is not sending you things that are close to their use-by date. The next thing we're going to talk about is TCS foods. This stands for foods that require time and temperature to control safety. These foods include dairy, shell eggs, meat, beef and pork and lamb, poultry, fish, shellfish, baked potatoes, heat treated plant foods, this would be cooked rice, beans, and veggies, tofu or soy products, sprouts, sliced melons or cut veggies, or any untreated garlic and oil mixture. Once an item has been removed from its original packaging, it is required that they are labeled. This label should contain the name of the product, the date it was prepared, and the date it needs to be discarded. The exception for this would be foods that are not uh, temperature controlled for safety and that are easily identified. For example, baby carrots. TCS foods that are kept below 41 degrees can be held for up to seven days. The count begins from the date the food was prepared or removed from its original container. When organizing your coolers for storage, it is important to keep certain foods in certain places. From top shelf to bottom, this is the way meat products should be stored. On the top, you would have your ready to eat food, then followed by seafood, whole cuts of beef and pork, ground meat and ground fish, and whole, ground, whole and ground poultry would be last. When we talk about cooking temperatures later on, you may notice that the higher the required temperature, the lower the shelf that it goes on. Next up in the flow of food is preparation. Preparation begins with the safe food handler. As a food service employee, you risk contaminating food if you have a foodborne illness, you have wounds that contain a pathogen, you sneeze or cough on the food, have contact with a person who is ill, do not follow proper hand washing procedures, or have diarrhea, vomiting, or jaundice. Work attire is very important in food service establishments. It is required by Maine Food Code that hair restraints and beard restraints be worn in the kitchen. Your clothing should be clean. Aprons should be clean and change if they become too soiled. Aprons should never be worn outside of the food service area. This includes the bathroom and while taking out the garbage. Per main food code, the only jewelry allowed from the wrist down is a plain wedding band. Fingernails should be trimmed, filed, and clean. Fingernail polish or artificial nails should not be worn in the kitchen. If you or your employer choose to, follow, uh, choose to allow nail polish and fake nails, the main food code states <clears throat> that the employee must wear gloves at all times. If choosing to allow this, please remember that you still need to follow proper sanitation, washing hands and changing gloves when changing tasks. 
Hand wash stations. Every kitchen must have a dedica dedicated sink for hand washing. These areas must include hot running water, a hand washing sign, soap, single use paper towels or air dryer, and a waste receptacle. Never use hand sanitizers in place of hand washing. Hand washing must be done before preparing food, when changing tasks, before putting on gloves, after using the restroom, after coughing or sneezing, after smoking, eating, or drinking, and after touching any part of the body other than clean hands or forearms. Bare hand contact is not allowed when handling ready to eat foods. Single use gloves must be used when handling ready to eat foods. This does not apply to produce while being washed or foods that although could be eating, eaten as is, are going to be used in a dish that would be cooked. Gloves are never a substitute for hand washing, must never be washed and reused, and must fit correctly. Using gloves that do not fit properly open you up to a couple of risks. If the gloves are too small, they could easily tear, exposing your bare hand to the ready to eat food. And if the gloves are too large, you could easily cut off a piece while prepping food, causing a physical contaminant. Cross-contamination is a common risk in kitchens and can easily be prevented. Using separate equipment for raw and ready to eat foods is one way of preventing cross-contamination. Color-coded cutting boards is one way of doing this. Clean and sanitize your workstation before and after all tasks. You can never assume this was done properly. So to ensure that, food, that, that the food you are producing is safe, do it yourself. Prep ready to eat food and raw foods at separate times. When cost-effective, you can also purchase foods that have already been pre prepared. Just make sure not to sacrifice quality as well. Next, we're gonna talk about the temperature danger zone. This is within 41 degrees and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Food has been subject to time and temperature abuse when it is stored at improper temp temperatures, cooked to incorrect internal temperature, held at the wrong temperature, cooled or reheated incorrectly. If food is held between 41 and 135 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours or more, it must be discarded. Monitoring time and temperature. It is required that you maintain temperature logs for your food, refrigeration, and for your dish machines. One simple tool can help you prevent time and temperature abuse. That is a thermometer. It is required that you check your thermometer's calibration once a week and that you record that this has been done. This can be recorded on a temperature log or on your production records, whichever is easiest for you. Knowing how to check the calibration of your thermometer is very important. There are two ways to do this. The first method we're gonna mention is the boiling water method. This is where you bring a pot of water to a boil, you insert the thermometer, once it stops moving, it should read 212 degrees. If it does not, you would then use the hex knot to adjust. The next method we're gonna talk about is the safest method. This is the ice water method. You fill a cup with ice and then with cold water. You insert the thermometer into the ice water and let it sit. Once the dial has stopped moving, the thermometer should read 32 degrees. If it does not, you then use the hex nut to adjust. Some kitchens only have digital thermometers and that is okay. It is still possible for them to come out of calibration. So it is important to make sure that you check those ones as well.
minimal internal cooking temperatures. For poultry, stuffing, stuffed meats, or anything previously cooked, it must be cooked up to 165 degrees for 15 seconds. For ground meat or eggs that will be held for hot surface, the temperature must be brought to 155 degrees for 15 seconds. For pork, fish, steaks or chops, roasts, or eggs for immediate service, you must bring them up to 145 degrees for 15 seconds. And for fruits, vegetables, and grains, they must be brought to 135 degrees or at least out of the temperature danger zone. Next on the flow of food is transporting. This might not apply to everybody, but if your school satellites meals, it is very important to make sure you are doing this safely. Always use insulated food grade containers. These containers should be cleaned out daily. Food temperatures should be taken before the food is loaded and when it is delivered. All food being transported should be labeled with a use by date and reheating instructions. Next, we are gonna talk about holding food. We all hold food for service in some capacity. We hold food to be used in meal prep in our coolers and freezers. We hold food in heating cabinets while we wait for service. And lastly, we hold food on our service lines as the students come through. When holding food, it needs to be covered. Lids or plastic wrap for storage and sneeze guards during serving. Hot foods need to be held at 135 degrees or higher, and cold foods need to be held at 41 degrees or lower. If using a non-refrigerated salad bar, ice and ice packs need to be used to keep the food cold. Monitor and log refrigerator and freezer temperatures. We will ask to see these during administrative reviews. Cooling foods. Making sure that you cool food safely is just as important as cooking them correctly. When cooling foods, they travel through the temperature danger zone. You must get them below this zone as quickly as possible to keep them safe. Divide large quantities of food into smaller pans. Using shallow pans is best. Using an ice water bath and stirring periodically can help the process along. When cooling soups or sauces, Ice paddles are a great tool to have and use. Next, we're gonna thaw our food. There are a few different ways that food can safely be thawed. This can happen as part of the cooking process, in the microwave, submerged under 70 degree or lower running potable water. But the best way, however, is in a refrigerator. This method allows you to thaw the food without risking it entering the temperature danger zone. Never run food under hot water or leave food on a counter to thaw. When reheating foods, whether it be food that is out for service or food that was previously chilled, it needs to be brought up to 165 degrees for at least 15 seconds. When dealing with food that is out for service, if you check the temperature of the food and it has fallen into the danger zone, you can reheat it as long as you can be sure that it has not been in the danger zone for more than two hours. Serving food. It is your responsibility to make sure that, food, that the food that we put out for service is being held at the correct temperature. Make sure that everyone knows whose responsibility it is to take these temperatures and make sure that it is being done. Remember, hot foods need to be over 135 degrees and cold foods need to be below 41. Self-serve bars present a unique situation of their own. Like all serving lines, ensuring proper temperature is important, but it is only one of the things you need to be aware of. Sneeze guards need to be in place and in good condition, and each item on the service line needs to have its own utensil. It is also a good idea to make sure you have extra utensils handy. At any time, a utensil could be dropped or sneezed on, or even placed in the wrong container, calling for its immediate replacement.
Next, we go into cleaning and sanitizing. All surfaces must be cleaned and rinsed. This includes walls, storage shelves, and garbage containers. However, any surface that touches food, such as knives, pots and pans, cutting boards, or prep tables, must be cleaned and sanitized. The order in which the process needs to occur is scrape or remove food bits or debris from the surface, use the proper detergent washing the surface, using clean water rinse the surface, and finally we sanitize the surface. Making sure to use the correct sanitizing solution, you can either apply using a cloth or a spray bottle. And always be sure to allow the surface to air dry. Make sure, make sure you know the proper concentrations for your sanitizing solution and make sure that you have the proper test strips to ensure it is the correct concentration. Now we're gonna talk about manual dishwashing. For manual dishwashing, you are required to have a three compartment sink. Before use, it is important to make sure that you clean and sanitize the sinks and drain boards. Just like the cleaning and sanitizing process we just discussed, the three compartment sink needs to be set up in the order of wash, rinse, then sanitize. You want to fill the first compartment up with detergent and water that is at a temperature of at least 110 degrees. The second sink should be filled with clean, hot water. The third sink should be filled with sanitizer and should be tested to ensure that it is at the correct concentration. If using hot water for sanitizing, it must be at a minimum of 171 degrees and items need to soak for at least 30 seconds. Make sure that if you are choosing to use the high temp sanitizing method, you provide your dishwasher with a clock that has a second hand and you remind them that they need to check the temperature of the water to ensure it maintains the required temperature. Machine dishwashers. Whether you have a high temp machine or a chemical machine, you need to keep a temperature log to ensure that the machine is operating correctly. For high temperature machines, you need to make sure that it is always reaching a minimum temperature of 180 degrees during its final rinse cycle. For chemical sanitizing machines, make sure that the manufacturer's instructions are being followed and be sure to monitor temperature and sanitizer. For all machines, make sure to clean the machine. Never put food covered debris through the machine. All items need to be prepped or scraped before being ran through. Never overload the machine. This does not allow for proper cleaning or sanitizing. And never towel dry. It is important for sanitizers to air dry. Once again, always make sure to monitor temperatures. Pest control. Maine is a very rural state. Because of this, the topic of pest control should be on everybody's priority list. It is required of every school to have an integrated pest management program. Make sure to inspect your space regularly. It is important to prevent entry and access. Do not leave outside doors open. You want to eliminate food, water, and shelter. Keep food stored in tight containers. Make sure if leaves are collected at your door, they are cleared to prevent harborage. And make sure to be aware of your school's pest logs and have open communication with your pest control operator. Food defense. It is your responsibility to protect your food. Think about where your food is being stored and how you are keeping it safe. Is it protected from intentional contamination? Are your storage areas locked so that your food and supplies cannot be tampered with when you are not around? Now we're gonna begin our conversation on standard operating procedures, also known as SOPs. Now that we have gone through all of the steps of keeping your food safe, 
we're going to talk about the written procedures that you are required to have in place to ensure that everyone knows your food safety plan. All schools are required to have a HACCP, which stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point, based standard operating procedures in place. SOPs are written practices and procedures that are adapted to suit the needs of your schools. SOPs should be reviewed annually and with any new employee. Also, if something in the operation changes, make sure to change any related SOP. Making sure that all your staff are aware and understand your school's SOPs is very valuable. This helps to ensure that everyone knows what is expected of them in regards to food safety. The Institute of Child Nutrition is a great resource for a lot of things. If you go to their website, which is listed below, you can find sample SOPs. If using sample SOPs from here, make sure to only use the ones that apply to your operation. Also, make sure that the policies are customized to fit your needs. Here we have a sample SOP. I pulled this one specifically because in Maine, the food code states that it is okay to wear polish and fake nails as long as you're wearing intact gloves in good repair. I know that most schools choose to stick to the no polish and fake nails, but if you have chosen to follow the main food code, this would be one example of how you could customize this particular SOP. It is good practice to review your SOPs with staff annually. This can be as part of your beginning of the year training and reviewing your SOPs can count towards your required professional standards hours. Anytime a new employee is hired, these should be given to them so that they can learn them and feel comfortable with what is expected of them. Some common review findings, um, review observations regarding sanitation and SOPs would include the following. Staff members wearing jewelry, bracelets, rings, other than a plain wedding band, um, activity trackers, etc. Your SOPs can be more restrictive than the food code, so we will make sure that you follow what your SOPs say. There is no specification for hair or beard length. If you have either, it needs to be restrained. Food not being stored properly. When we come on site, we look in your coolers, freezers, and your storage rooms. Not documenting temperatures. When we come on site, we look at your temperature logs for your coolers, your freezers, and your dishwashers, and especially your food temps. We also look to see if you're recording that you have checked your thermometer's calibration. This needs to be done at least once a week. Temperature logs should be held onto for the entire school year. SOPs should be customized and reviewed annually. We look for documentation showing that they have been reviewed. Something as simple as a sign-off sheet is acceptable. And health inspections not being posted in public view. This is a requirement and could result in a finding. The most recent health inspection needs to be posted where anyone can walk up to it and reading it and read it. Posting it in the kitchen does not count because there should not be anyone in there that is not part of the nutrition program. I hope that everyone has been able to take something away from this presentation today. Regular oversight of your school sanitation practices will help to ensure that your school nutrition program operates as safely as possible. For more information on food safety and other training resources, you can visit the Child Nutrition website. Thank you for your time today.